straight out of the T dot. That's what it is. Live from the six boroughs. Don't go nowhere. For sure. Welcome to Standing in the Six. With, with, with your hosts, Michael and Constantine. And Miguel Anthony, live. Three and two and one. Well, good morning, everybody. Okay. Today, oh, we are excited. Oh, we're recording right now. We're live, man. Come on, man. Um, today, we have a very special guest. Uh, we had a chance to meet the wonderful man known as Jim Bremner. Uh, probably <laughs> he doesn't always say wonderful. So yeah, yeah. Right. Probably, I would say, I don't know, um, what, 2020 at some point, Jim? Was yeah, it? it's been a while since uh, the COVID set in. Yes, and Jim uh, is the rep, and not only the rep, the founder of Canadian Tactical Officers Association. That's correct. Correct, known as the CT. A O O A O A, <laughs> and uh, that's that's gonna go again in my screw ups, um, my screw up bucket. This is consistently inconsistent. Consistently so it's all inconsistent. That's, that's it's good. all good. But you know, for me right now, uh, you know, we we are so happy that you are here, and I actually, you know, your resume is so thick. <laughs> I, I don't want to do it injustice, Jim. Tell us a little bit about yourself for the, the listeners right now. Well, I've been involved in law enforcement for about 36, 37 years now. I've been very fortunate, uh, of course, through hard work, that I spent uh, close to 20 years with the SWAT team, uh, another five with the gun and gang unit, uh, five at the academy as an instructor, and uh, went back to being a bomb tech um, about seven, eight years ago. So I've been a bomb tech actually for 25, 26 years, and I'm probably the oldest longest serving bomb technician in Canada at this point. Wow. Mm. Okay. Really? We, I, we didn't know that. I didn't know that. No. Okay. No. Uh, from past conversations. Another first. No, well, for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> from past conversations, and again, if this is something that we can't see, we can always delete it. Understood. Flashpoint. Yeah, Flashpoint. Tell us tell us about, just because your, your expert level in, in, in the bomb elements were a transferable skill that they needed for their show to kind of show how much credibility was to, I guess, what they were doing. Well, it's actually a remarkable story um, in that I was in the hospital when the concept of Flashpoint came about, and I was in the hospital as a result of something called post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. So I was an inpatient for about three months in a place called Homewood uh, out in Guelph, which is a wonderful excuse me, facility. And uh, when I got out, I received a phone call from Mark Ellis and uh, Stephanie Morgenstein, of, uh, who were the producers of Flashpoints and the writers. And they said, listen, we have a concept, this is what we're doing, would you come in and talk to, the, uh, talk to us, the writing group? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to do that, I'm flattered you'd have me. And you have to understand that at that time, I was feeling pretty not happy about myself, mm -hmm. right? So I'd lost a lot of confidence and uh, kind of down the down low but it, that said I said okay I'll go in and meet now Flashpoint was unique in that it was a CTV CBS production it was a joint production and uh, the Americans you know being uh, American and if you watch American movies and television which you know we're all fans of uh, the typical police show is a lot of action uh, action driven mm -hmm. uh, but when I told my story to the writers uh, you could hear a pin drop in the room uh, as it was never demonstrated in a show what a police officer that's been b involved in shootings or multiple shootings, uh, what their life can turn into. And that actually changed the direction of the show. And I think what's unique about Flashpoint is you actually get to see what, what people take home, uh, the baggage that they have to take home and eventually deal with. And, and I think, uh, now that with that said, I got a team back, right? I got a team, albeit they were actors, but I still got to put them through the drill, teach them the weapons discipline, how to move, you know, what to do, what not to do, how to, you know, function as a team. And I think ultimately that came through in, in, in the uh, end product of Flashpoint. Mm -hmm. mm. No, that's good, man. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, to me, uh, I remember that, that, that story piece, and that, that's, like, look, you hear in movies all the time, we reference movies right now where, you know, the scenes on you got to just you got to you got to you got to trigger the bomb and they're trying to find it, the red wire the white wire all that kind of stuff have you ever had any moments where you're in a situation where there's like all this pressure on you that you got to do something right now before it gets very very bad yeah 
I made a career of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything stand out? Anything stand out? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it, it, you know, quite honestly, I'm, 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 I'm old now. Yeah. You know, I'm over 60. Uh, and it's funny because I'll get together with my colleagues and they'll say, you remember this call? I'm like, if you say I was there, okay, but no, I don't remember. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, we, we go through a lot of things. Uh, Again, movies aren't reality. We don't actually cut wires and, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. It, it's right. not something that, that we do. Uh, we right. do everything as remotely as possible with technology and robots and things like this. And that's what keeps us safe. Another mm. win for robots, guys. Oh, 100%. Uh, no, another uh, win for robots. What's okay. interesting about the robots is over the year, uh, the more uh, adept they become, uh, more human they become in terms of their movement, and capability, uh, the less we actually have to go hands-on with devices. Okay. okay. So it's it's uh, it's fantastic technology. I think there's something that you were saying in kind of your intro about l being in the hospital, PTSD. It's something that 10 years ago we heard sparingly. 20 years ago, never, no one ever spoke about it. Okay, kind of the you know the everyday civilian, the everyday person. In the last two years, last year, you hear it a lot. You hear it a lot, and it's. Uh, I've noticed that it's. It's now gone beyond law enforcement or people in the military. You're hearing it in so many different types of professions, no matter uh, what it is. Funeral homes too. There's like it, it could be. It could be anywhere. Okay. Through that, I mean, what what's amazing about going through something is, I mean, you put it on the table here. You have we have your book here, a copy of your book, Crack in the Armor, and this is a book that you had penned as the author of it. Perfect. Yeah, we I forget we have camera, <laughs> um, and. You know, it, can you s can you speak a bit about this, the the, the life work, the being able to to uh, I know it's it's a big thing on your heart to be able to help people who've gone through this, especially other people that have been in law enforcement. Well, PTSD is a human condition. It, it's not, uh, you know, uh, central to the military or law enforcement or you know what people would consider high risk endeavors. Uh, it, it's it's just part of our our nature it actually is based in our evolution and and simply put uh, you know if I condition you to be, be afraid of snakes if I put a piece of rope on the floor with enough conditioning mm -hmm. you'll think it's a snake mm -hmm. and so what happens is we try to avoid those types of situations and then we become fearful of things that really are of no, no concern and it's, it's illogical but it's a survival mechanism with, with that said um, you have to understand that law enforcement and the police, uh, uh, sorry, uh, military law enforcement, uh, unfortunately, we've chosen to go into traumatic situations. That's our choice. Mm -hmm. um, that said, years ago, there wasn't a lot of training. So where I could be physically sound, tactically sound, mentally prepared, it was not something that was... Uh, really on the table as part of the lesson plan for young officers. The first thing a young officer or young soldier should learn first day is your life has changed forever uh, because you just won't see. Uh, again, we're, you don't see things, normal things. Yeah, you're going to be exposed. Up until that point, your night life is fairly normal. Yes. And from that point on, if you don't have a, a way to deal with these stressors, they pile up like baggage in a in the closet. Yes. And so what's happened is through awareness and training and uh, understanding what it is, that it is normal and it does mean that you're, there's something wrong with the individual, uh, that they have to be shunned or, or any of these things, it's gotten better. So we have ways of dealing with it, understanding it, and, and uh, helping people through those times they'll get back on their feet. Can I ask? I know there's like very specific information to help people. There's a lot of resources now. Any words for people that I think everyone knows at least someone now that is suffering oh, from this. Any in that second circle, whether it's family, it's a spouse, it's a brother, a mother, is it like an employer. We've you know, as an employer, we've had people that work here. We have high stress Absolutely. situations, and they disclose that they suffer from PTSD, having mm -hmm. a stint in military, and and then it's you know, what could that next layer that that next person what what could they i mean 
any words that just to help them on how to navigate that, what to be sensitive to, how to help people who are suffering from it? One word. Yeah. Listen. Amazing. And uh, because I'm not always looking for an answer, but I am looking to, for someone to listen. Mm-hmm. And if you can compassionately listen unconditionally, you, you're doing your job. You're, gonna, you're helping that. Even though it seems like you're not helping from your end, it's probably the biggest help that, that you can be. I mean, so you're not you're not a problem to be fixed. Absolutely right? not. Yeah, you know what I mean, no. right? Because yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and it, this is why you see dogs uh, so helpful because they're totally non-judgmental. Yeah, totally non-judgmental. <laughs> Zero opinion. <laughs> right, and and that's the f- that's the fantastic thing. So if you can, you know, be that canine for that person and just listen and accept unconditionally, you'll see that person start to to move forward. With that said, the other thing that I say to people is that you have to take this upon yourself. Uh, usually if somebody comes to me and says, you know, says, Jimmy, you know, I'm not feeling too good, this is the situation, I'll say, how long do you want to be like this? It's totally up to you. Wow. Right? And, okay. and, and so I, you can lean on me, but understand I can't carry you. So if you're waiting for a system or an agency or what have you to, to get you better, it's, it's probably not going to work as fast as, as if you make it some dis- decisions and redefine your life and, and start to, to move forward. You've got to go out and get that, get that help. That's empowering thinking. I mean, you can apply that to anything. I'm going to remember that. Like, how long do you want to be like that? That's well, the thing is, is that you, you want uh, self-actualization is the, is the final part of the pyramid when people get back to being what they are, what they were typically in job settings we try and keep that person out of that position because we're trying to help them but that is actually hurting mm-hmm. them so when you give somebody like me with uh, with you know uh, and again you kindly reference my cv somebody like me you give me a job answering phones how do you think that makes me feel mm-hmm. you think you're helping me mm-hmm. but not actually so it's my it's my job was get to get back to the bomb squad yeah. That was my that was my goal. Yeah, and you got to want it. You've got to do it all over again. So yeah. Let me ask you a question. I mean, obviously, uh, the the book "Crack in the Armor" uh, speaks specifically from experiences and how you can cope. Somebody with PTSD, uh, for someone listening, and they have no idea uh, what post uh, traumatic uh, you know uh, stress disorder is. What are, what's going through the person when they're getting an episode? Like what's going so, so they can almost okay. know how to navigate around that individual. That's actually, yeah, that's a good. So question. Let me a question. let me ask anybody in the room: Have you been in a car accident? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'll ask you, Constantine. Where was that car accident? Where was it? Yeah, where? Uh, that's a good question. It was somewhere in Vaughan. Vaughan. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And what time of year was it? It was in October of 2000, sorry, 2000, that's too early. It was uh, 1997, and I took my parents' car. I went to go get laser eye surgery, right. and after <laughs> leaving the laser eye surgery clinic. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah. With I, your new fresh eyes? With my new fresh eyes and my dad's <laughs> Z24. Nice. Um, oh, hey, I, nice. I pulled out, and I uh, didn't see the car, and bam, I got hit. Okay, so let me ask you this. When you go back through that area again, do you, re- do you remember that accident? That's a great reference. Yeah. 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 Um, no. I mean, what, I, what I mean... Does it, come, does it come to mind? Do you, do you on an average day? No, like when you, when you go through that exact Yes, it does. It does. Okay. It does. Okay, so that's interesting. Now let me ask you another question. Two days ago, what did you have for lunch? Ooh. Uh-huh. Oh, well, that's easy because I have green, have sm- I have green every smoothies day. every day. <laughs> okay. but, but, but to answer your question, if you asked me what I had for dinner two days ago, I, would fr- I wouldn't be able to tell okay. you. And, and so that means that hmm. that accident has left an indelible Impact, mark in yeah. your memory. Okay. Right? Again, now it's an evolutionary survival mechanism. It's ingrained. That, yeah. that when you go through that intersection, mm-hmm. I have to be watching out for That's threats. Right. So, again, when you look at uh, law enforcement or soldiers, what do you think uh, when firecrackers are going off on Victoria Day, what do you think that's like wow. for them? Okay. Yeah. So, right. when what you just said right now, I'll tell you what resonated with me. Uh, about seven years ago, I worked with the City of Toronto at a place called Seton House, yes. Homeless Shelter. Yes. And it was, uh, I've seen many, many deaths. Yeah, but, absolutely. But, but the, one, uh, the one death that I saw that kind of almost haunted me was I saw a hanging. Okay. Oh, yeah. And I remember uh, one of the things that we always used to do in the shelter is that check on the homeless people to see if they're breathing, right? Sure. Just seeing their chest, absolutely. right? Yeah. So after that hanging happened, what I did for months, 
months after so i would just go into my kids rooms just to see if they're alive and if they're breathing is that kind of like what you're that's talking e- about that's exactly wow. what it is but so for after an incident like that uh, if you ha- you can have post traumatic stress which is normal but if it at lasts between 3 to f- more than 3 to 4 weeks and now your life is changing and the comorbidity is always drink, drug, eat, don't eat, gamble, sex, a way of distracting you from those thoughts. I don't want to think about putting my hand on my child's chest to make sure that they're breathing, so I'm going to drink, I'm going to drug. And that numbs it. But mm-hmm. the problem is now wow. you're, you're circling and you're going down and you're getting dragged and in. And that happened with my partner. 100%. He, 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 le- he went to alcohol because and of that. And it's totally normal. Okay. So what we have to do is get people and, and change that. And, and, and again, uh, here's the, you know, <laughs> I don't make, mean to make it sound easy, but through my experience, the thing to do is get involved in cognitive behavioral therapy mm-hmm. and take your medication as your doctor has prescribed, and you'll find that it won't fix things. You won't be on the medication forever. It's like being a diabetic that needs insulin on a daily basis. It's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. And that will slow things down. It, it stops the anxiety. It stops the panic attack. It stops the flashbacks. And you can start to cognitively discuss what those triggers are and how to avoid them. Wow. Uh, again, if you take dogs, they're a great example. If somebody's been bitten by a dog, now they generalize and they fear all dogs. But it only has to do with that particular dog in that circumstance on that day. Not all dogs are bad. I mean, one p- the Rottweiler got that reputation. Right, right? absolutely. Or the pit bull. I, was, pit bull. I was bit by a Rottweiler, yeah. but I love dogs still. I've been yes. bitten by many <laughs> different types <laughs> she of was. dogs. Yes. But, but, yeah, but I have to understand that of those dogs that bit me, I'm only talking about those dogs. It yes. doesn't, it doesn't, it's not uh, across the board all dogs are yes. bad. Right. So the, the easiest way for me to get somebody... Uh, accustomed to being around dogs is to take them to the dog part through exposure showing that not all dogs bite then they be they lose the fear and anxiety around what they have created within their own head right so by exposing people uh, to what they fear and generally police officers fear people you actually have to get them out more with people that aren't cops to see that the world is actually quite a safe place with a lot of good people out there. Is what you hiding is not hiding's not helping. Again, right. this is not what we're talking about, but what you said there is exactly how racism is eradicated. Yeah. It's the exact same way. It, it's right. it's a similar concept yeah. for sure. Yeah. Hundred percent. So interesting. I mean you know police officers on a daily basis are making good decisions, but they're also making bad decisions, right? And a lot of the times when I say bad decisions, sometimes it could not be intentional, it could be based some experience that maybe they went through and because of that i mean if to your example you know uh, an officer was shot sure. by a certain ethnicity and then for whatever reason now they've carried it on that that ethnicity is a threat that's going to impede their job and make bad decisions for them correct i i would say uh there they'd be unsensible conclusions that they come to right uh, um but you have to understand that uh, the body, uh, again, uh, we're using our cognitive uh, powers here, mm. uh, but once our heart rate goes above 115 beats per minute up to 145, and in some confrontations it can go as high as 300 beats per minute, wow. the, the, the human can no longer think. It can only react. And, that, and, and so many times when we think of an officer in a, in a high-pressure situation actually making a cognitive decision, it's the furthest thing from the truth. They're actually, again, making a decision uh, uh, in part of the brain that, that, frankly, is incapable to make decisions. It can only react, and it reacts on threat cues. So it's going to respond uh, as it does to simply to survive. Mm. Right? Some officers don't survive confrontations. Some do. Mm-hmm. How we got to that confrontation, I don't know. Um, but, uh, again, uh, with that said... Uh, could could we do better in terms of understanding one another? Hundred percent. There's there's no mm. question about that. No, that's good. That's good. I, I got a quick question. So, sure. y- um, you you're, you're saying um, that it's a human nature or it's a human condition, the PTSD. 
PTSD, right? It's, it's part of our makeup. It's part, part of it, our makeup. It's, yeah, and again, like it's built in, in, in our survival mechanism through evolution from thousands of years ago. It, it's not yeah. so, there's nobody that is human that cannot be exposed to the possibility of yeah. PTSD. Do you, with, with that said, do, do people like, because I feel like it has, does it have like a negative, because it's had the word disorder, like, Interesting you know. Interesting that you should say that. Because if, <coughs> if it's a disorder, you might want to, you mean denial that I'm, I don't have that, right? But you're saying it's, it's natural that we would have stuff like that. Yeah, well, again, as humans, we like to categorize and, and put things, you know, eggs all in the tray in the yeah. same position every day. And, and that's part of being human as well. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Grenier, uh, the Canadian military, actually doesn't use the word disorder. Mm. Uh, they, uh, I just can't, the term uh, that they use in the Canadian military just slips my mind. Uh, at the moment, but it, it's but is it for that reason? Yes, because because soldiers are all about order, so they don't like that ah, they have a disorder, so they've removed that. And perhaps the acronym will come to me before we end. But okay, but yeah. it, it, it yeah. or I'll find it for you. But it is different. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, because yeah. it's the way it's framed. Right? Well, we're all about words. Like yes. humans are all about words. Yes. And and if again, part of being um, emotionally intelligent is being able to pick the right words with the people that you're sitting with at the time yeah because some words uh again inadvertently offend people and mm -hmm. you have to you got to be on your toes right because you denial could be a thing right like oh i don't have that or oh denial is a huge part of yeah. it especially for men men, That's men right. can't stand the fact that they might be perceived as weak right so men in fact usually are the last people to get help and it's called post-traumatic because it's it's post-event and it took me four years to, to finally break down, to come to my knees. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but I had to lose my mother and father on Christmas. I was in a shooting on my birthday. My, uh, I was in a second shooting on New Year's, which is my daughter's birthday. What? And if you ask me what my uh, anniversary is, it's 9-11. So oh all of those goodness. things wow. can be can be triggers. <laughs> and so it's not just the job that you do; yes. it's what's going on in your personal life. So you talked about the second layer of what what other people in your life can do. Well, if you've lost your support network, right, of your mother, father, a brother, Jeez. grandmother, in that same time period, what do, what what are you left with? Well, you're left with drinking, drugging, eating, <laughs> not eating, right, and this Everything type else of thing, you said, right? Yeah. So eventually that, that'll tear the person down, and, and it's absolutely true. Until you hit bottom, some people will not acknowledge they need help. And if you are, a, you know, if you look at, again, the book or my career, clearly at some point I was a person that didn't believe they needed help. You know, pride is a, is yeah. a uh, can be a dangerous thing. Can yeah, you give man. us an idea of CTOA, the Canadian Tactical Officer Association? Mm -hmm. Why does it exist? What, what, what was the intention of it? W and um, what is it that you're doing? And what do you hope that it can grow into? Well, CTOA in the United States, they have something called NTOA, National Tactical Officers Association. And this is a, a group of officers that bring the most recent relevant realistic training to law enforcement across North America. Now, I've been fortunate to work uh, municipally, provincially, federally, internationally. I t spent a lot of time in the United States, but it occurred to me about 10 years ago, we've got a lot of professional people here in Canada that are my colleagues. So why not develop the same model here, become a conduit for training? But the difference is here is that we're not focused specifically on SWAT teams or specialty teams. I want to download what's in my head, what's in our head to the frontline officer, further that to security or any other group of people that just want to learn. So through my uh, contacts, I can put you in touch with just about anybody that we consider uh, to be uh, high level and, and uh, somebody that we support uh, to get you the, the best training that you can possibly get. So it's really we're a conduit for, for training information. If you go on our Twitter every day that you can see on the website, uh, it's nothing but law enforcement uh, articles, uh, videos, things to look into, you know, how to keep yourself safe. We have a newsletter for members that are, if you care to join, you can go on and look at the newsletter. And we're always looking for people to uh, write in and ask us questions. We look at product, product development. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it a benefit? That type of thing. 
Okay, great. Yeah, and I think yeah, that's key t- to touch on. If if you're listening, you never know at your place of work, you could have just come out of a robbery. There was a robbery or something sure. there, and you need to like, who do you call? And, okay, if they're not, uh, if not actually calling police to police it, what do you do after? You have you know seventy staff, and they're terrified, and and they're making demands. We need a better security system, and we need to do this, and like, yeah. um. So the CTOA, in one way, as the sheepdogs to protect people, you know. Um, and that actually is the logo, isn't it? Yeah. That's our logo, is yes. to protect people and guardians of the flock is our motto. Yeah, and I, I say that just because, you know, if you go on the website, it's a great website and it can give you an idea. There's a network of people there that uh, you can be put in touch with that can help guide you. And I think it's just a lot of these things, because we have a lot of our clients, they, they bring up these questions. They don't know where to go. There is no real source. They just, you know, mm. uh, especially because, especially if you're trying to be proactive, how do you, in a proactive way, uh, keep your, your workplace safe for your home. Well, you know? again, we, we can assist with that. Yeah. And, and uh, if we don't have the program, we'll find a group that has the program, could be Sentinel, could, mm-hmm. you know, we'll find the experts for that particular uh, niche that, that you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, amazing. Well, that's good. Uh, I remember, uh, Jim, we, got, we brought you in, I think it was, again, you know, it feels like the whole entire 2020 was a blur. Like when I'm thinking <laughs> about it. You know what? I don't even <laughs> acknowledge it as a year because I <laughs> I, everything just closed down. And I think yeah. we all lost a lot of yeah. things. It was a year. sideways year. For sure, yeah. yeah. So you were going to say, so sometime in 2020. Sometime in 2020, the frozen year. Um, <laughs> I remember uh, you did a, a session with our people and um, there was some scenarios involved. And I'm going to actually uh, splice some of that into, uh, into this when it gets uh, pushed out. But it was something that, you know... We uh, did active... Is the actual wording was active attacker. Active, active attacker. attacker. That's right. I mean, Mike, why don't you uh, go into a little bit more detail? Because I know you set a lot of that up with Jim. Well, c- kind of what the ask was just our teams. We have security teams at work in places of work, you know, and th- it always is, what would they do if there was an active attacker or shooter? You know, what is the role of people that work there? What is the role of security? Imagine you are just there with your family and like, what are you supposed to do? And uh, we had asked Jim if he could take us through some exercises of that. You know, the thinking, obviously, a lot of the content you had was was law enforcement level. It was of, of the highest level in terms of response. Um, but you gave us insight into the thinking um, and I guess, yeah, maybe speak on that and that, that experience. I think it was about, we had about, we, I think, 30 people that were taken through different types of scenarios that went as far as uh, emergency, you know, medical response if someone got shot and even mm-hmm. barricading a door. Right. Well, I- again, um, the, the basic thing is to understand is not to, not to be a victim. Okay. Th- so if you put anything in your head is, is that I, I won't be a victim. So with that said, I consider everybody smarter and stronger and younger than me and f- more physically fit. But what I won't do is I, I won't play their game. And, and so th- uh, in point of fact, about 4% of active shooter uh, resolutions are by unarmed, untrained civilians. So wow. this is usually left out of the equation when we're talking about training. Uh, what's remarkable is you'll see uh, some, again, I'm not talking about all officers, I'm talking about a tra- in a training environment, mm-hmm. uh, you'll see out of thousands of officers uh, that some will say, I, I, you know, I won't go given this scenario, I don't have enough training, yet 4% of civilians with no training, mm-hmm. uh, no tools, will, re- will resolve that situation. And they're basing that again on, uh, you know, adaptive survival skills through evolution is which is basically run hide or fight so if you can't run and you can't hide the last thing you're you're left with is to fight in a mouseful <laughs> fight right so y- y- this idea that you can't teach that to people um i i don't know that that's true because ultimately i don't i don't know that those are thinking cognitive skills running you see a threat you run uh, you know a child will run when it sees a, a threat uh, hiding uh, again children will hide when presented with a threat and fighting again I- every creature on earth will fight if it has to do that mm-hmm. and it's it, what's interesting again is it's proving successful in some cases I, please understand I'm not suggesting that. I won't fight with somebody if I don't have to running is my first choice makes perfect sense um, but uh, again it's just something to be aware of and in that said uh, probably the biggest thing that I could teach people is uh, what we call the 
tactical combat casualty care, which is basically how to apply uh, a tourniquet and a pressure bandage. And that has proven to save lives more than anything. Is that the stop the bleed? That uh, 100% stop yes. the bleed. Yeah, that was a great and because program. without blood, you know, we don't function very well. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. actually the key. And again, that's been learned through experience uh, overseas and, and here. In fact, in the United States, beside the AED on the wall, you'll find tourniquet stations, and the, the staff are taught how to use those. Okay. You have to remember as well <coughs> that active shooter is really, you know, arguably a, a, an American phenomenon. Uh, it, yes. We see it here occasionally, depending on what you pr would prefer to reference. Ours are more mass shootings than they are active shootings. Mm -hmm. and, and with that said, we're in a building today that's maybe, what, eight stories mm -hmm. tall, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, most active shootings are over between two and eight minutes. Usually the active shooter takes their own lives. So how long would it take you to run through a building this big? Probably more than eight minutes. Mm -hmm. And so if you hid and uh, barricaded the door, chances are you would survive that, that mm. confrontation. Interesting. Active shooter is not going to try and break into a barricaded door. They're going to continue to move, Open path. hence the name active, Yes. and mm. they gravitate to whatever target they can find, unfortunately. Yes. Right. Path, path of least resistance, 100%. essentially, right? So yes. any resistance is a, a huge uh, variable, right? There's a lot of variables in it, yeah. but uh, again, by understanding it, you can you can feel a little more confident that you'll get through it if you follow some basic rules. I, I had a client who uh, I won't say the location. I'm used to quoting who they who it is and where. Sure. Yeah. She was frantic. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. She had someone in the, a very large building, uh, someone in the night who surprised her. It was uh, someone uh, who had found their way in probably just scouting for criminal purposes to, to lift mm -hmm. something. The person eventually left, but she realized being about 110 pounds, this guy was easily like two, 220. She said he was twice my size, easily. Yeah. He could have done anything to her. Mm -hmm. The fact that he walked out, it was, at, it was at one in the morning and the building was quiet. She was just about to lock up. Um, that made her terrified. Secondly, um, later on that week, she saw some stuff happening with some shootings happening mm -hmm. in the States. And she just kept, I remember she kept asking me, what, would, what do we do? If someone was shooting, if someone came in here, what do we do? What do we do? And I say that because um, it surprised me how much this was at the forefront of her mind. It wasn't just like, and this is, this, this is wasn't like, this is a regular person living everyday life, just working. But it was like something that she truly was saying. I have no yeah. idea where to what begin. What to do? Where to start? Yeah. Where, where to well, start? Okay. And I, I would even go as far as to say that, like the average person probably walks quite terrified going to the ATM late at night, mm -hmm. getting into their car late at night. You know, there's just, there's a group there, I'm by myself, but they don't really know how to, how to like have personal security, personal safety. Well, the, the, the first thing is to be situationally aware. And what that means is just pay attention to what's going on around you. Yeah, there's a group over there by the car. Maybe I wait 20 minutes till they leave. Mm -hmm. then I go out when I believe it's safe by watching my closed circuit TV or whatever the case is. Maybe I call a friend and have them come and meet me and we go home together. It's something like that. So, uh, but that said, um, if, you know, I don't watch the news. I'm aware of the news. I pick mm -hmm. the sources, you know, that I, I look at uh, essentially uh, to put on our Twitter to, you know, punch out to law enforcement so they can see what's going on today. So they're situationally aware. But I, I, I think that, uh, again, uh, we, we can create an ambient fear that's probably not really necessary. You know, the, the, in fact, crime rates are actually down if we follow the statistics. Uh, but if we look at the media perception, it would appear that they're way up. Yes. And, and, and so really it, 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 it tend, you know, it, it's kind of what you want to, uh, you know, put on. your put your, you know, faith in, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. You know, but uh, but again, common. It's it really a lot of these things are are common sense. Be situationally aware, it's, and for women, uh, girls in my house, they've been taught since they were little children, is that you make as much noise as you can, and you don't let anybody take you anywhere. That's a good and, tip. And yeah. That's, That's a good tip. Yeah. 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 Why? I'm going to ask why. Well, why? Because people, the, the criminality, they want un unanimity. They don't want to be discovered. Mm -hmm. So if you make uh, a scene in a mall, 
that person's going to leave. They're not going to because they <laughs> they want to perpetrate again. So uh, again, I won't play your game. Men, women, you never let anybody take you anywhere. You never agree with that. That's never a, a good yeah. scenario. So the minute someone snatches you, for example, you <laughs> just start screaming. Yelling, your head off. screaming, making a scene. Yeah. That brings everybody in the mall to do this, to yeah. turn to see what's happening. People start picking up the cell phone. Phones, Security yeah. is called. So again, that individual wants to do that tomorrow or the next day. They don't want to go back to incarceration, so they typically they leave. That's good. I'll, just, I'll tell you a quick. Uh, we have a Brazilian operative who worked with us, sure. and her grandmother um, was walking through Brazil, very dangerous neighborhood, late night. And as an old lady, she was walking, and she saw a group of guys. One got up uh, with a firearm. She saw him get the firearm, get it ready, and he came across the street to whatever he was going to mm -hmm. do. You know what she did? She saw him, and she ran toward him. She ran toward him <laughs> and she grabbed him by his face and she said, please, I'm terrified. I'm terrified. I'm, I want to go to my family. I, I, I'm not too sure what to do. Okay. The guy put the gun in the back of his, of, his, of his pants, took her by the hand and said, look, look, you shouldn't be here. And he brought her to a safe part and walked her all the way. That was okay. very unsafe of her. So, <laughs> okay. would you recommend that? So I say, <laughs> no, but like, no, but you do you get the point? No, but that's actually <laughs> interesting because yeah. if we look at some uh, mass shootings or active shootings, shooters have actually bypassed uh, potential victims because they looked at that individual's oh, eyes geez. and they hum now that person is humanized. That's right. Yeah. right? So interesting. That's so, good. so predator prey, right? I mean, there's a, there's a right. dynamic in now. There. Now, in in terror situations, that looking in somebody's eyes is not the best no. thing, <laughs> right? But 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 again, I, not everybody under you know it, 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 there are a lot of variables. But there, there is evidence that in uh, some cases mm -hmm. that humanization of the potential victim yes. prevents them f from being further victimized. Hmm. Okay, wow. Well, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. That's a true story. And it happened twice. I'm sure it, it is. It happened yeah. twice. Twice? Yeah, it happened twice, sir. So it's oh, like, that's like her go-to. So I kind of set it on the podcast. If you're ever in a situation yeah. like that, <laughs> don't postulate like the lamb. Just be, you know. Um, Cooperation, ask the, ask the lion's again, help. In, yeah. in most cases is going to benefit a potential victim of wow. robbery certainly well that's uh, restorative justice right that's the whole yes. that's the whole yes. idea of restorative justice is right. to bring the the victim face to face with the correct and and just this is how this is what you did to me yeah you're just kind of preempting that that's that, right that process wow yeah, mike when you when you yeah. when you introed him you said something you said bomb squad Yes. Or something like that. Yeah. So, and then you said, you said, you know, we're not cutting wires. No. Yeah. I don't know anything. I think you're cutting wires because that's what we see on TV. <laughs> yeah. The red one. No, the black one. No, no, the <laughs> red one. And, the and meanwhile, right. the, the camera cuts to the timer going down. <laughs> and it makes for the best it's, movie. And it's the TV. longest 10 seconds ever. Yes. Right? <laughs> so I, I bring that up because, um, so I'm reading a book right now, um, High Performance Habits. I don't okay. know if you know Brendan Burchard. The I'm not familiar with that. It's great. It's, it's about high performers. Sure. So, 10 seconds on the clock, you're down one, fr free throw shot, high right. performer. I would consider it being a bomb squad guy, <laughs> yeah. a high performer. So, like, uh, like even though you, you say you're not cutting the wire and it's not like that, I'm sure there's, like, like what's going through your your mind? Like, like are you feeling pressure of, you know, oh, my gosh. It's just getting, getting the job done. It's really, that's what goes through your head and i'm sure that would be the same for a basketball player a yeah. baseball player just work. calm collected just do my job yeah. Yeah. We're, it's a job in like that I, yeah. we understand the the parameters of the job we understand how to reduce risk based on training and that's and doing it by repetition over and over and over again. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, yeah, yeah I mean, Same there's thing. absolutely a lot of uh, training that goes into. But the, repeti the repetition just things. reinforces focus. The Because what you just said is no matter what's going on, focus on what you, what it's the task. Dis it's discipline. It, yeah. It's, it, it's, mm. uh, it's like a martial art. It's like anything, uh, a sport, any, it's, it's a discipline. And so that's why people on particular units are selected because it, it takes a lot of focus and a lot of discipline to do things a certain way without varying. The, the, the unique thing about explosive disposal is that you can't shortcut anything. So, yeah. so a call is always going to take three <laughs> hours. Yeah, exactly. Regardless, there's no, there's, we, we can't, in tactics, there are kind of little tricks that you can shortcut things and speed things up a little bit perhaps. But in, in bomb work, that that's just not possible. Well, 
I'll say that you are an absolute wealth of information. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know what kind of started even us having you on our show uh, was that you were also looking at passing. E- even though you have so many portals of information, you want to pass more. And, 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 and then you have a podcast that you're basically working on. Yes, it's going to be called Cop Pod. Cop Pod. And uh, <laughs> we, nice. our first guest will be former police commissioner Norm Gardner. Okay. We'll have renowned uh, criminal lawyer Gary Cluley. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're going to have Phil Gursky from CSIS. What's Cop Pod about? Cop Pod is, again, it's, it's just about, uh, you know, policing issues, if you will. Uh, once we get rolling, it'll just be, let's have people, you know, cops phone in today and what's going on in your life and, yeah, you know, cool. how do that you feel and how can we resolve that? And, uh, and that's really the idea of it. Okay, it's and the audience would basically be beyond law enforcement. You know, it could be it could be law enforcement, people looking to be in law enforcement. It can be security, it can be military, because mm-hmm. those are all part of our membership. Okay. Uh, but, but again, uh, the topic for Norm Gardner will be uh, reduced budget, modern policing. Where do we go? What, what you know? And, yeah. and, and, and so it's really to, uh, you know, get out. Uh, you know, like where are we right now? Where are we going? What's the future? Okay. And and of course we'll you know we'll ask all the questions. What did you think about this article today? You know, are we happy? Are we not happy? Have the public call in? Let's uh, let's get that out there and find out what's going on that's in the community. Cool. No, that's okay. awesome. That's awesome. And is everything established right now? Like, is there, is there a launch day that you're looking for? Well, we hope to record next week. Okay. Uh, Grant O'Sullivan, my producer, is, is uh, I'm in his hands. Nice, and nice. As I said, I'm old, he's young, he knows the <laughs> technology. <laughs> and we have all the guests lined up. The interviews hope to go between 15 and 20 minutes. Okay. Nice. And uh, again, I'll be asking for more uh, people to call in. Okay. We're hoping to have Spider Jones on. Oh, nice. We'll have nice. A, a number of uh, people on it. Again, that's just what's the feel out there. That's you know, good. And I say I say to our audience to check it out because Jim has a huge network of high level, um, high functioning um, professionals, co- covering everything from yeah, you know, tactical tactical teams to Krav Maga to like everything. Well, we'll have the uh, you know forensic psychiatrist Peter Collins on forensic psychiatrist yeah. uh, Jean Yves Gagnon. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll have many different guests from all walks of life yeah. on there. I, I would say that if you're not a cop, it'd still be worth tuning in because you're, you're going to hear oh, how yeah. people... I hope so. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, stuff all around. If you ch- I'm an actor. If you check out my IMDb, I played a lot of police officers. So <laughs> right. If okay. you want that perspective. Well, that right. Actually, yeah. We could, we could uh, <laughs> see what that's like. Yeah. yeah. Listen, uh, Jim, honestly, like I'm so happy that you came on board. Uh, I think there's so much in this time that someone can take from this. For anybody out there st- uh, suffering from PTSD... Crack in the Armor. Where can they get this book, Jim? Amazon. Amazon. Crack in the Armor. Never, never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually, you can get it uh, as a read online as well. Okay. So okay like nice. a, kin- a Kindle, you don't have to buy the the, uh, the full book. If, okay. Yeah. Okay. Save and, yourself and a few dollars. Are you going to awesome. do, are you going to record an audio book? Uh, possibly. We could possibly do that. Grant, is that something we, uh, yeah, we yeah. can I we can, can narrate. <laughs> no, I say. <laughs> you have a better voice than I do. Yeah, with, the, with the British accent. British? Yeah. Can we Whatever get this you British? Want. This chapter <laughs> British, next chapter <laughs> Indian, <laughs> third chapter Jamaican. Okay. We're going for no, a that's awesome. International. No, but you should. I say that just because it's a fast world right now. A lot of people read by listening. Well, actually, okay. I do a lot of that. I find yeah. it's a good way to it's go to bed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Big you know. time. And on top of that, for anyone that is interested in bettering themselves, information sessions, connecting, networking, uh, the Canadian Tactical Officer Association, what's the website for that? It's CTOA, uh, www.ctoa.ca. .ca. Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. And I'd say, look, uh, the other reason why an audio book is good, it saves face because certain you know titles someone's reading on the subway or you know like understood remember that book <laughs> how to win friends and influence people <laughs> right, 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 people right, didn't right. like yeah. habits like you know yeah. well they made they made comedy uh, sketches of people <laughs> yeah. making funny things and just filming them on the oh, on yes. the subway oh yeah i never yeah. saw that but it's it makes hilarious. sense it's and so. you can follow us on twitter at at ctoa o c c s okay okay perfect and we're gonna have all the links uh yeah, yeah, that are we'll gonna be pushed in the video Thank you so much for coming down. Uh, we are actually uh, looking. I, I'm, I'm actually really going to read this because we actually have some people in our team that have actually referenced this. I understand more now than I did before. I mean, mm-hmm. like to me, this was huge for me to understand that. I'm and happy and, to and, and you put it into such like 
Mm-hmm. Main examples that could that I, that I was able to relate to, right? Mm-hmm. So thank you very much for yeah, that. Yeah, I think Joe. I think it's great. I'll just say one thing: like I coach a lot of basketball, sure, and and like kid, that's this stuff is it's not just for law enforcement; it's for people who miss that free throw on sure. the lat. Man, they live with that for like yes. And it, it affects them. They yes. remember it and they're just like, I dropped the ball. I at the end, let of, you know what? At the end of the day, we all have to learn not to be so hard on ourselves. Yeah, that's I, very I think, true. You know, because yeah. uh, 100 years from now, who's going to remember? That's true. It's true. Right? But uh, I think, again, there's huh. we can that's put ambient point. pressure on ourselves. It's yeah. really not necessary. I like that. Right? Be Beautiful. kind. Be yeah. kind. Be kind to yourself. Beautiful. Last right. words, Mike, since you usually say last words. Uh, it was a pleasure, and I'm glad that you <laughs> learned something today. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks very much, Jim. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Pleasure, buddy. See you. Make sure to drop by next week. Let's go. Go, 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 go. And don't forget to subscribe. Let's go. It's time to give a shout out to our sponsors. This podcast is brought to you by Sentinel Security Plus. For all your premium security needs, visit SentinelSecurityPlus.com. Sentinel